What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Tactical Chinwag Podcast. I am your host, Luke Jillings, aka Original Human, and today we are joined by my dad, Steve Jillings. How are you? I'm great, thank you very much. So, <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> so I, I wanted to schedule you first because obviously we just had the kid. I couldn't schedule a bunch of different people because I didn't want to commit to something that I couldn't, like, I might not be able to do. So it seemed like you were the perfect person to get on because not only can I just get you on whenever I want because you're my dad, but also you have an, quite a lot of experience in the military. Yeah, I spent um, 10 years in the Royal Navy. In the Royal Navy. So, um, when, so t- let's go straight to the beginning. Let's go straight from the start. Like age of you signing up, what was training like and all that good stuff. Go ahead. Well, uh, I went for my medicals and all of the exams when I was 15, uh, probably halfway through my last year of school. And then I joined on the 14th of May in 1979, Jeez, four days 79. after, <laughs> <laughs> four days after I left school, I was on a train down to Plymouth to HMS Rally. Yeah. Uh, joined HMS Rally, which was a week like doing um, basic stuff, getting your kit sorted out and getting your uniform to fit and all that sort of it, you know, just a, like a beginner's week. Yeah. And then six weeks basic training at Rally. Uh, I failed the first time. I got back class one week. Oh, yeah, one week. And then passed it the second time. I failed it on the English test because oh, yeah. I'm rubbish at English, at spelling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but my maths is brilliant, but... It'll be the other way around with, with spelling. Yeah. Uh, passed it the second time, like I said. And then I did another six weeks at Rally, which was my seamanship training. Okay. Where we learned all, how to sail boats and had um, a few weekends away on yachts, sailing yachts from Plymouth to uh, Dartmoor and places like that, to the Naval College at, at, up the Dartmoor River and everything like that. It was great fun, really good. Really enjoyed that. The seamanship training was brilliant. I really loved that. Yeah. Especially with all the boat work and all the rest of it. Yeah. And then uh, I went, left Raleigh after passing the seamanship course. I went to HMS Cambridge to do my gunnery course, which was <laughs> weird because, I mean, you you go to this place and after, well, it's not there anymore. They've closed it down. But it was like a little outlet just outside Plymouth Harbour, on the left-hand side of Plymouth Harbour, as you go out, and there was two little islands adjacent to it, which was the Big Moo and the Little Moo. And they used to use Little Moo for target practice with the 20 millimetres. Interesting. Stuff. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if they le- still do that. <laughs> no, because it, it's shut down now. The, the actual HMS Cambridge is shut down now. They closed oh, it, it down a few years back, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we... Did um, naval gunfire, which was the 4.5s, which is everybody sees at the front of a ship. Mm-hmm. I then learned uh, we did uh, small arms fire, all the usual weapons. We fired um, anything from 9 mil all the way up to the 4.5. But what yeah. we load the 4.5s at that size, I wasn't firing them, I was only loading them and in the gun bays and stuff like that because it was a higher course for. For actually firing them, it was a leading man's job, not a, not a junior seaman. I was only a junior seaman, I was only 16, 17 when I was put in the gun bays and all the rest of it. You have to watch your fingers, right. especially when you're loading the shells and the cartridges onto the onto the tray to get them rammed into the barrels. Right, right. Because it come in two parts. The shell's probably 55 pounds, something like that. Single how long shell. Was this, how long was this training? Eh. Uh, I'm not sure now. I can't remember. I think it was about, oh, about 10, 12 weeks. Something like I can't remember now. I honestly can't remember. Yeah. And and that's where I, we had this little machine that you looked into. It was like a, like a game, really. And it was, uh, you had to put this, using your thumb to steer it, you had to put this light into the middle of the crosshairs and hit the target, probably target that was supposed to be there. And that was for CCAT training, which was a surface-to-air missile, which was... And I got 99% hits. 
<laughs> so I became a sea climber, nice. which is what I was part of my career for most of, well, 99% of my Royal Navy career was uh, working with the sea captains of his two air missiles. So when you actually passed out of training, um, how old was you? I was just gone 17, probably 17 and a half, so I'm not even that. And I joined my first ship just after Christmas leave in 1980, which was HMS Hermes. And that was before she had the ramp put on her and before um, Harriers were introduced. She was only a, a helicopter carrier, then not a registered um, aircraft carrier. So she only carried helicopters at the time. And the day after I joined it, at 17 and a half, I went to the West Indies for six months on a jolly. <laughs> Not so, game, is it? <laughs> you know, so I joined the ship and I just said to the lads, like, what's happening? Where are we going? Are we going anywhere? And they said, yeah, we're going tomorrow. We're going to the West Indies for six months. Jeez. So it was a quick case of getting ashore and getting the phone and phoning your nana up and saying, look, I'm adios amigo. I'm going to the West Indies for six months. Jeez. And it, it was a brilliant tour. It was just a jolly before the Hermes went into refit to get the, the ramp put on her. And uh, it was, it was just a jolly. It was... I mean, my first port of call in the Royal Navy was Trinidad and Tobago. Wow. So <laughs> you must have phoned Nana up and just been like, she must have been pretty jealous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I phoned her up, uh, I'm, I'm, it's me, I'm, uh, I won't be able to talk to you for the next six months, I'm going away. <laughs> Jeez. So how long, at, at, let's let's move forward a, a little bit. Um, tell me about, like, your first understanding of when it was kicking off in the Falklands and not only when, when you found out it was kicking off in the Falklands, but when you found out you were going to go, what was all that like? Uh, well, we was on um, exercise in Gibraltar. Okay. And um, A Royal Marine that. place, by the way, Gibraltar. Anyway, go <laughs> <laughs> And, um, yeah, we was on exercise. It was called Spring Train, which was... Uh, big exercise out in the Mediterranean with a lot of different navies. And uh, I was on the pot wash duty at the time. <laughs> so, I mean, just part of what you got every now and again, you got pot wash. And it was my day off. And we was we were still at sea. We was, I was I was in my fart cart doing nothing and just lounging around the mess doing that. Like. Yeah. And um, well, that lad's come down, he went, Steve, Steve, you better get up. There's, there's going to be a briefing. I said, all oh, right, yeah, right. What's going on? We're going to the Falklands. The Arches have invaded the Falklands. We're going down. So I thought, oh, I'm scratching my head. What's the bleeding Argentinians invading an island off Scotland somewhere? Because that's where I was. That's where you think it was. <laughs> Never heard of it before. Falklands, where's that? Up of Scotland. <laughs> wow. Because nobody, I, I didn't have a clue where it was. I was like, I was 18 years, 18, 19 years of age. Yeah. I mean, I just didn't have a clue where anybody was. Like, well, where's, where's the Falklands like? Yeah. Anyway, we had the brief and we was we were going down. We had we were Admiral's ship at the time. We had the Admiral on board and um, we sailed to Ascension Islands. So we would, on the way down, we was doing replenishment at seas, constantly topping up um ammunition, fuel and food stores and all sorts of stuff, ready to go down to um, to the Falklands. Yeah. And we got to Ascension Islands and then there was there was only about, well, I can't remember, there weren't many ships then, there was only about four or five, I think, that came out of the Mediterranean. Yeah. And we waited there for a couple of days and then all the rest of them turned up with Hermes and Inventable and everybody else turned up and then it was a case of staying there for a couple a few days just uh, cross decking supplies and ships that weren't going down that was on spring train was okay. on the way down to ascension islands were just getting rid of all their ammunition on the ships that was actually going down there so it was a constant workload and you know we were constantly busy you know what i mean and we uh, yeah. we sailed for ascension uh, on the way after we'd sailed from Ascension, I think, sure it was after we sailed from Ascension, um, a Russian bear bomber flew over the top of us, about 200 feet above the ship, because they was Russian. obviously spying on us. So, yeah, just, they were spying on us to so look at it. And this thing was massive. And you, 
I mean, it was a, we called it a bear, and it had propellers, and it was a big old bus yeah. of a thing flew over the top of us on the way down. So they, like I say, they was probably obviously keeping an eye on where the, the task force was. Yeah. And then as we got closer and closer to the Falklands, um, the Argentinians started taking notice of us, and they sent they had a um, like a spy plane, which was a big Boeing or something like that that they had up with the radar on. They was tracking us. Um, and it was getting closer. And when we got into like the 200 mile zone that they'd created around the Falklands, Glamorgan was tasked to shoot it down with a sea slug missiles, but we never Did got you get the to chance. Do that? Oh, no, okay, okay. it never turned up. Oh, that's <laughs> as, soon as, we got, as soon as we got in within the 200 mile zone, it did one light. I mean, it never, yeah. it never popped its head up again. Right, right. Excuse the brew. Uh, Sorry. And then we, uh, we like I said, we got to the, the, the exclusion zone and bits and pieces out of uh, the ships, like, departed into to groups. And we had, there was three of us, there was two 21s and Glamorgan, and they called us the three musketeers. Because <laughs> every night we was going in, doing bombardments and all that stuff. And I remember the, the first day, it was the actual day that, People probably either do know or don't know. It was the day the, the Falcon bombers went in and bombed Stanley Airport. Okay. An amazing feat of from the RAF to actually fly 8,000 miles and drop bombs on an airfield and then fly all the way home again. Right. And it was the same day that the reporters were on, I think it was on Hermes or Invincible, I can't remember what it was. And it was the famous saying, I counted them all out and I counted them all back in again. Right. Because the, it was the first time that the Aria jump jets were used to uh, bomb the Argentines, and they did Stanley Airport as well. So we're talking and like then, the very start of everything here, though, aren't we? Yeah, this yeah, the like, very first day. Well, like... yeah, first day of actual when we got there, like. Yeah. So then it was our turn, and it was middle of daylight, like it is, like it is now, and um, I can't remember what time it was. And I remember we, we, the first time I seen the Falkland Islands, and we was we were tasked to do some bombardment, and I think I think that was Stanley Airport as well. I can't remember. Yeah. And as I looked up, there's a a vivid a memory of my my head of this uh, HMS Glamorgan, and she was flying battle ensigns, and battle ensigns are massive, big, you know, the, the British warship ensign, the, right. the white white and white one. She was flying three of them, three battle ensigns, so I thought to myself, if the artist can't see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they had these how, massive... How did you, how did you, sorry to sorry interrupt, but when, like, this first kind of, like, day or two, or the first week, should we say, where it all started really, like, ramping up, how did you feel? Did you, yeah. was you nervous? Was you excited? Well, like... the first day it, it ramped up. Yeah. Because I was, um, I was a secret aimer in the port director, which right. is like a, a mechanical device with a pair of binoculars and you you, zoom, you, you turn around and yeah. look for airplanes and surface vessels and all that. Lot. And it was my job to spot planes if they'd read that in there. And I was doing what they call scanning, which is like you do a, a scan of, across the horizon and then you go up and then you go up and go up and go up yeah. and then you come back down again. And I started my scan on the on the land, and as I was scanning across the land, I seen uh, Argentinian um, trucks going up this path or whatever. But we was we was too far away from them. I mean, we was we was tasked to do other stuff. We couldn't just we couldn't just hit a truck because you could have had civilians in it, so we we wouldn't have engaged it. Yeah. And as I got to the point of the land where it met the sea, it was like a, a sticky out bit. I seen two black clouds like things and i always remember when i when i was in training and when i when i was doing training on the ships and everything else, if we ever went against a, a plane you won't know what it is a big phantom jet uh f4 phantoms they always had a black stream of smoke coming out of the engines yeah and that's what triggered me off yeah so like i said i got to the end of the land and i seen these two black streams so as soon as I saw that, I knew it was airplanes. Yeah. So I screamed out alarm aircraft 
uh, which is about 11,500 yards or something like that out. Yeah. Uh, two Mirage fighter bombers and two Argentinian Mirages. And I tracked them. What they did is, instead of coming straight towards the ship, they came along the shore mm-hmm. and then turned turned into the ship. Yeah. And as it was, because it came up the back end of the ship, I couldn't open fire because I couldn't fire across across the the flight deck. Yeah, yeah. So it was coming right up right up the back of the ship towards us. Yeah. And as I was still watching them coming towards me, and as I was watching them coming towards me, they started firing the guns. Yeah. And they, you could see the bullets hitting the water as it was getting closer and closer to the ship. I remember thinking to myself, oh, it's true, it does look like that when you see it on film. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, this two planes going to bomb me here in a minute. And then the next thing you know, they both dropped bombs and they came down on parachutes and blew up behind the ship. And then they, apparently they fired two rockets that went either side of me and my mate who was on the other side of the ship. <laughs> And they missed us, apart from a bit, a bit of damage on the back of the ship where the, the shrapnel had uh, got a few shrapnel holes in the back of the ship. Yeah. They missed us, and these things were massive. I mean, I couldn't believe how big they were. And they were flying, flying about 10 foot above my head. And they missed you. <laughs> and they missed us. And I'm thinking... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these planes just flew right over the top of us. And... Wow. Right. We, we carried on doing some bombardment, and I carried on looking, and there was no other planes came came in and uh we finished the bombardment and we, we, we were sailing back to the, the main task force to to do what we did every day of the week every day apart from i think it was two days we we went in every day did the bombardment at night go back out again and we was probably you talk about sleep deprivation we was probably getting if you was lucky four hours sleep a day yeah or the com- Complete time you was at war, and I went from a little fat, I don't know, about twelve stone to nine and a half stone. Jeez. There was nothing in the can, nothing in the, the naffy canteen. You could get half a Mars bar or a couple yeah. of fags if you was lucky. Yeah, and for my American <laughs> friends, fags means cigarettes in England. Okay, just so just so people are aware, cigarettes. That's a cigarette. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Anyway, anyway. Yeah, so actually, so... actually, um, so that one part with the the bombs nearly hitting you, apart from obviously the big incident that we'll get into in a bit, in a bit, is that the closest that you came to being hit? Well, well probably because I mean, every time we went in, there was firing at us, right? With the land um, guns, you know, the howitzers that were on on the land, yeah, and you could see them trying to hit us every night. There was trying to hit us with the shells and we could see bombs going off you know in the shells hitting the, hitting the sea but yeah. i mean trying to hit a, a moving target with a stationary gun that's probably not got the best radar or a, a radar at all it's pretty pretty impossible um yeah uh, so it was it was kind of hard to believe that i mean we're firing them and they're firing back at us which is fair enough i mean Right. We was doing it every night to them. I mean, we hit some. We did um, the bombardment for the SAS on Pebble Island when they attacked Pebble Island and destroyed the the aircraft on that. Glamorgan it's huge, huge in history. Yeah, Glamorgan did the naval gunfire support for the SAS when they went in there and did Pebble Island. We did. Uh, I'm sure we did um, Goose Green as well, which is part of the um, Paris history on it. We did yep. two sisters for the Royal Marines, yep. which is another big thing. Um, so while you yeah. were doing this everyday thing that probably started to feel a little bit kind of mundane after a while, right? Well, did, did it? No, no, because you were that hyped up. Oh, so you were you constantly like we're going to get yeah. something done here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, because it wasn't a case of oh we'll go in we'll do a bit by mama and come out. You was constantly. The pressure, you know, I mean, the, the actual pressure yourself. Yeah. You know, I, I've got to. You know, my job was air defence, so right. if I don't do my job, the rest of the lads get a good kicking, don't they? Yeah. So at any, like, literally at any point during this time you were there, then bombers could have come back again. Well, yeah, well, it would have been caught at sea in the daytime, but we did most of the bombardment at night because we knew their their aircraft um, didn't have. C 
surface, air to surface radar. Okay. Not, well, I don't think many of them did. I think the the end super Nintendo guards did that to um, fired um, Exocet missiles, which was a bit bit of a problem. Um, right, right. I remember when Atlantic Conveyor got hit by an Exocet missile, and I, I remember when Sheffield got it. Well, I mean, I remember seeing uh, smoke on the horizon when Sheffield got it, yeah. um, which was a bad day. Um, but it's just one of those things of war, isn't it? We, we lost, what, four ships, four or five ships down there while we, yeah. while we were doing it. There was yeah. um, three ships hit by Exocet. Two of them went down and one didn't, which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, it was um, it was constant. You, the, the only time we really had a, a respite was we they sent us to... Um, the control area, well, I can't remember what it was called, the control area or something, where they had um, supply ships, yeah. where they was cross-decking supplies. And they sent us there for a, for a weekend just to, um, because we were constantly going in day in, day out, well, night in, night out, constantly yeah. going in and doing bombardments. And um, they sent us there for a couple of days, which um, I think it upset the, the, the routine a bit. I, I, think, I think the lads would have been better off staying where we were and just going in and out but it was it was um once that was over we was back in again and the three musketeers were at it again flying around driving up between the two um sailing up between the, the falkland islands there's two two major islands in the falklands and we was yeah. constantly going up and down and causing havoc <laughs> Yeah, with, so, with the four or five guns <clears throat> during, this, during this time was you tasked with anything um Anything when it comes to uh, lads going in and out of the island? Would you task with any any of the movement picked, in that part? Um, we picked. Uh, I remember um, once uh, the SAS um, parachute we did into the sea from an Hercules. Okay. And we uh, picked them up. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, okay. So because they they, um, they lost a, a fair few lads. Uh, on a sea king that went down between, which was uh, deck up in between two ships. I can't remember what right. ships. I think it was Hermes and Intrepid or something. Right. And um, they lost a, a fair few lads when a sea king went down, which yeah. was bad news. Um, so we we went. We was tasked to go and pick these lads up that jumped into the sea from Hercules, which wouldn't have been nice jumping into the South Atlantic and <laughs> it'd be bloody freezing. Yeah. So that first day when it all kicked off, that was you going like, "Okay, this this is happening." Then we were actually doing this. Then. Yeah, I remember my, when we'd finished the bombardments and everything. My opposite number, it, it was a, a Geordie lad, and um, he came up. He went, "When this is all over, me and you are going to have a serious drink." <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. I bet. Yeah. So, so it was. Sorry, go on. It was one of them things. It was just um, you weren't scared. It wasn't scary. I think it was because you trained that much. Yeah. Yeah, you know I mean, you you didn't your scariness wasn't there. You just clicked, and it was all your training just kicked yeah. in. You knew what was which different parts were going, and all the rest of it. Like, and it was right. after it when it when it gone and they flew over the top of us and that. And I was thinking, whew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. you're not worried about them turning around, or well, I've... probably they, they wouldn't have done anyway because they probably expended all that ammunition firing hours. Whatever they brought with them, they probably probably got rid of and bugged off home. Like I mean, yeah, just the luck and gone home. So, yeah. but it was it was a uh, it was an eye opening sort of event, which yeah. was uh, not something you see every day. Yeah. <laughs> so how long was it between? Uh, the start and the incident that we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, I think it was only a couple of months. I can't. I honestly can't remember how long it was, Luke. Because, like I say, it was um, it was quite a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but how it was, long, it was, how a, long was the Falklands War? Eighty-two. It was. No, how long was it? It wasn't that long. I think it was only was, was it March till May. May, something like that, March, the end, couple, beginning of March. Couple, some, couple months then. About four, about four or five months, I think, at, at the most, oh, okay. I think. And okay. when they actually took, when they actually invaded to us, actually yeah. getting rid of them. 
So, so let's talk about what happened. Obviously, at any point, if you don't want to talk about anything, that's totally fine. Don't worry about it. So talk about the incident. Talk about like the build up, what was happening, your task, and how it unfolded. And at any point, if you want to skip any parts, then you can do it. It's okay. All right. We was um, tasked again to do uh, bombardment, um, Mount Elliot and Twin Sisters, and it was merely the final push for um, the the foot war, the foot battle. To, to tell you the truth, I mean, like the main ring of uh, mountains around Stanley, and it was to take charge of them, you know, to to get rid of the archers off them, and then it was yeah. a case of right once we do this. We have a clear view of Stanley, and we can we can look at what happens after that. And we've been out, and we'd we'd done we'd done the bombardment um, at night time, what, right? Uh, yeah, at night time. Uh, I can't remember what 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 mountain we were. I think I can't remember what it's twin sisters or that area or something like that. I can't remember what it was called now. Yeah. Or Sapper. I can't remember. And um, we was tasked. Like I say, to do the NGS, and we finished on the gun line probably about half five, six o'clock in the morning. Yeah, and um, as we was coming out from the gun line, um, the Argentinians had moved uh, a couple of Exocet from one of their warships and put them on the back of uh, trailers, okay, which is a uh, Quite a, a big feat of engineering, to tell you the truth. I mean, you think about it; they're not designed for that. You know what I mean, right. and they fired the they apparently they fired the first one at us. Why do you think they did that? Why do you think they moved them? I think it was just to protect Stanley. Okay, from ships, so you don't think you know it was I mean? anything to do with um, needing to take them off the ships, as it was to keep them on the land or put them on the land? Well, yeah, well, I don't think that once we sank the Balgreno, that was the end of their neighbor. They never came back out again. Right, right. Um, I mean, it's like, practically... It, it seemed stupid to go against the Royal Navy at that point. Yeah, I mean, we had... Apparently, well, from things I've learned from history books and all the rest of it, um, we had they had two two task groups, the Argentines. Yeah. One was to the south of the Falklands and one was to the north. So they was going to do a pincer movement and attack the... Um, the task force in a pincer yep. movement. One, the, the north side had the aircraft carrier, and the south side had the, the Balgreno, and a yep. few other ships. And um, HMS Conqueror, which was a submarine, she sank the Balgreno with um, torpedoes. Yeah. And then it was uh, one of our other submarines was tracking the aircraft carrier, but it was in um, shallow waters. Right. So they couldn't open fire on her because obviously it was in shallow waters. Right. And she, she, as soon as the Balgrano went down, she turned round and went back to port and was never seen again. And their navy was never seen again yeah, after yeah. We, we got rid of that one. So, but it was, it was one of them because they, they had, they had frigates with um, Exocet missiles on them. So that was a bit of a, a bit of a concern for us. Um, and yeah. so they took, like I said, they took. I think it was two two extra sets off, and put them on this little island just off Stanley. Okay. And um, fired the first one at us, and apparently that. Okay, we're back. The internet went uh, second, uh, but we're back. And you were just talking about uh, them putting extra missiles on the island, basically. Yeah, yeah. They put it on. They put the extra sets on on trailers on the, this island just off Stanley, apparently. Uh, then they fired, like I said, they fired the first one and it misfired. Um, and then they fired the second one and that was a successful launch, um, which was headed towards us. And um, the navigator and the, the officer, the de officer to watch on the bridge actually seen the launch and seen these this thing coming towards us. Yeah. So they started moving the ship so that the, it was. It would have been a, a stern hit if it, if it hit us. And uh, then we got the, the alarm aircraft, which um, is a trigger to say that there's something coming towards us. But our system was switched off at the time. So the lads down in the, the system control uh, switched everything on 
and as soon as it switched on, I got power. We, we were locked onto this thing, and as I looked through my binoculars, it was all dark. I couldn't see at first. I switched the um, the crosshairs, and we have like two red crosshairs in your binoculars, and that's where the missile. That's where your that's where the target is, and that's where your missile is supposed to go. Right. And then we fired. I fired the the Seacat, and Seacat went. Seacat goes up. And then you, you have to bring it back down. And as I brought it down, um, it was it was not it was close enough, but it, the distance between the actual missile and my missile hadn't gone far enough for the actual missile to to detonate. And then the next thing, the Exocet hit the ship about uh, probably 30, 40 feet away from where I was stood. Um, there was a big explosion. Uh, the this the Seacat director that I was in was covered in flames and the glass was all shattered but it didn't break you know so it was like bulletproof glass but yeah. it was the right mess and that's the last I remember um just the, the flash and then this and then the next thing I remember was sat in the um the sick bay and uh, just sat in the corner um with a blood in me, on my leg and um, and I had a shrapnel wound to the legs and I've shrapnel in my backside and all that. And um, while I was there, there was, there was lads that were being brought to the sick bay that was just, um, you know, arms, legs missing and burnt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I stayed there for, for about an hour just watching and doing all this and the doctor gave me some morphine strapped me up, <laughs> excuse me, and put me in the, I think it was in the wardroom or somewhere, with another one of my mates, my, my opposite number, it was in the CCAP, um, ready magazine, he, was, um, he had shock, um, which was, he was pretty bad with it, to tell you the truth. Yeah. And um, then the uh, helicopters came and the, we, we um, carried out across the uh, the flight deck, and I remember we was on the starboard side to go down the flight deck because the port side where I was, where the Exocet hit, was just destroyed. There was like thirteen lads killed, thirteen of us injured. Um, but the ship survived. She was a big old girl made out of proper metal, and she was a big old. And if you tub. didn't, if you didn't deflect it. Well, I don't, I, I don't know whether I deflected it or, or not. I don't know. It was yeah. seconds, like, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, but you, you could have, actually... it could have hit something more critical, really, if you didn't yeah. do what yeah. you did. You yeah. Know? So that's what we want. Um, and I remember being um, stretched down the starboard side, and all the, the lads that, were, uh, that had been killed were all lined out on the deck, mm-hmm. ready for. Um, Ready for burial at sea, and he was um, buried at sea just at nightfall, all 13 of them together. Yeah. And I was taken to Hermes, which was funny because it was my first ship. <laughs> right. uh, and a couple of lads who I knew were still on the Hermes. Wow. So they'd, they'd been through it. Some of them come down and visited me. I had the operation on, on my leg. On the Emmys, they cut away some of the dead skin and all the rest of it, yeah. dead tissue. Um, couldn't remove any of the, the pieces of metal inside me because it'd have been like digging in there forever. Like I mean, you still so... have there today. Go, oh yeah, go, go to the airport every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, still got still got bits of pieces of Glamorgan and uh, this extra set inside me. Yeah, and um, yeah, went got. Hermes had an operation, spent a couple of weeks on the Hermes, I think, four, three or four weeks. Yeah. And like when the when the exit it was the Argentine surrendered two days later. So that's wow. how close it was to the wow. end of the war. Um yeah, and uh, from Hermes I got sent to uh, the hospital ship which is Uganda. Okay. And then <clears throat> They had, the Navy at the time had um, these small vessels um, which were used for um, maps, map 
cartography, whatever it is, you know, surveying, the, et survey, survey ships, and um, they were like used as ambulances. Which is what they I was used for ambulances, which was the Akla and the Herald, I think it was. Okay. Uh, I can't remember which one I went on. And we went to Uruguay, uh, to, Uruguay um, to Montevideo. Okay. And we um, flown. What, what, funny thing is, only we, was, we went to Montevideo and you go up the, the, the River Plate and the Steinhaus, Stein or a German battleship that was... Um, <clears throat> that was um, scuttled by the Germans is still in the is still in the river. You can still see this big battleship on the yeah. top of it. Like, I mean, uh, the guns have been taken out and put ashore somewhere. And then we 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 got in Montevideo. And then we we flew from Montevideo to Bryce Norn um, on a RAF DC ten. Yeah. Um, got to the hospital at uh, Bryce Norton or on RAF base. I got it. Don't know whether it was Brian's not or somewhere else, and that's where you met your nana and your granddad again. They would all come down to see me, um, and then from there I went to um, our, 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 hospital, our Royal Navy Hospital Hasler, which I think it's shut down now, okay. which is a big old place. And I spent, I think I got out of there in Septemberish, something like that, yeah. and then uh, I went back to the ship, back to Glamorgan. And then from there, I, I was on there for about, probably not long, probably a couple of months. And what was it like was, going back to the ship after all that? It was strange. It was, um, yeah, the, the atmosphere was strange. You know what I, mean? yeah, I remember yeah. I remember what, sitting in the hospital watching uh, the telly, watching the TV as um, Glamorgan came home. Yeah. With all the people celebrating them coming home and all the rest of it and I was given the choice to go and watch the ship come in and I thought to myself well not really it's more well for the families of the people that are that are home you know what I mean they're coming right. home rather than me sitting on the side of this in a wheelchair so I, I, I said no to that one and then I like I said I came home I left the hospital came home for a fair few weeks uh, having the nurse come to the house every day just to change my dressings, yeah, but, and then back to back to the ship then, and then uh, I, like I said, I was only on a, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, I can't remember now, not long, and uh, I was drafted to HMS Pembroke, which was shutting down at the time. It was it was closing it down. It was um, part of uh, Chatham Naval Base, where they built the Victory. Oh, okay. So that's, I mean, it's a, it's a strange place. That is. It's, it's like going back in time. They've got a, they had a, a building there, which was one of the longest buildings in, in the world at one stage. Longest buildings in the world. Longest building in the world, yeah. And it was designed for making ropes for the, um, oh. the Navy ships. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and weird. I went in it to have a look around. Yeah, it was, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. And you think about the, the, um, at the start of the navy, that was where it. I mean, we all kicked off properly. Yeah. So let's yeah. let's. Uh, so obviously, you got out. You're happy now. <laughs> two, two, two beautiful, handsome kids. <laughs> and everything's all well and good now. Um, yeah. Because we're pushing on the time right now. I I get a lot of questions about. Um, it's usually young kids asking, "Hey, I want to go in the military. My parents aren't really keen on it." Um, so from your perspective, what was it like when I started taking interest in the Royal Marines and when I went in, cause I went in the same age as you went in. So yeah, what, you what did. was, what was that like whole process as a parent like, and, and how, what advice could you give kids who were in that situation that we were in when we were, I was talking to you and when you were talking to your parents, what, what would you give that, adv what advice would you give and what was it like for you? I think it it's have a really good think about it. Yeah. Because it's not it's not an easy it's not nice but you know you're gonna say I mean I'm thinking of the parent side, I mean um it was probably one of my proudest moments when you join the Royal Marines and you got your green beret and everything. But I think the apprehension was was a lot between for me and your mum because right. of um would you pass would you pass the training? Would you get hurt? I mean, things you'd 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 see that I'd 
I'd seen and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, is it, do I really want you to go to go through that? Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's your decision. I can't, I can't say to you, and I would never say to you, or to, to Stephen, if he wanted to do the same thing, I would never say no. Right. Right. Because I think going in the forces helps you to stand on your own two feet. It does. It definitely it gives does. You, it, it, it matures you earlier. Yeah. And I think it it gives you that that confidence that you know the people that are around you are yeah are confident as well. And it's, it, bring, it brings you in as a kid, great. shakes you up a bit, gives you some scars, and then chucks you out again. Yeah. Assembling yeah, some yeah. sort of man, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it does. But it helps you, like I say, it helps you stand on your own two feet, and it helps you. Look at thing, things, look at problems in a different, you know, different um, aspect or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, some, some things you, you look at and you think, nah. <laughs> and then you, 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 some people say, oh, I've had a bad day. Have you? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? yeah, I get it. I get it. You know what yeah. I mean? and, yeah. so, and I think another thing is just the sense of humour. Yeah, I don't think you can beat it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, the sense of humour is let's have a cigarette and crack on, like. <laughs> yeah, I always say when people ask me, I, I've had, I had some of the best times in my life, but I also had some of the worst times in my life, and it was in a very oh, yeah. condensed, condensed yeah, time frame. I mean, yeah, I mean, I had some some brilliant times and and yeah. some really, you know, I mean, bad times, but yeah, um, I think it was more brilliant times than it was bad times. Well, that's good. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, some of the places I went to see were, were unbelievable. You know what I mean? Well, you lads in the so, navy get it easy. You get to sail around a lot. You get to visit <laughs> all these places. We sometimes yeah. get to tag along, which I did. We sometimes get to tag along, but it's a bit <laughs> different for you guys, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, well, you know, we we run aground once, which was a bit a bit weird. Yeah, uh, that was Uncle Morgan as well. That was we was out in the Gulf, and we'd been on the Banyan. And you know, you know what a Banyan is when you go out and have a party on the beach, right? And uh, where was it? I think it was Old Man or Jordan or somewhere like that. I can't remember where it was now. Yeah, and we was in this little uh, bay, and it was the yeah, obvious gorgeous. Nothing there, nothing but sand. You know, right, <laughs> middle right. of the day, we're like. And uh, we all got back to the ship and then picked up the anchor. And as we picked up the anchor, we realised that we were sat on a rock and it chewed the propellers. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it was a big wobble like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then we sent the divers down and the divers were bringing up chunks of propeller and all sorts. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I bet that was a nightmare. So we got in trouble for that, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, we was all putting on bets where we was going. Like, where, where's the nearest dry dock? You know what I mean? We were Hong Kong, Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're going home, lads. <laughs> Well, it's been around 45 minutes, so uh, we'll, we'll end it there. Um, any last little bits of advice to both people going in and their parents? Expect the unexpected. Okay. And to the parents, don't be too apprehensive about it. Let them live. Yeah. Cool. All, All right. right. Well, well, thank you for being on. Um, All right. Anytime. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get you on a, again at some point. We'll go over some more stuff. Uh, but that was incredible. Thank you for telling me that. Because some of that story I, I haven't even heard. So thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I uh, you're welcome you. anytime, sunshine. Yeah, I love you. Um, okay. Uh, I love you too. And, I'll, uh, and for everyone watching, thank you. Or listening, thank you. And uh, I'll see you all in the next podcast or in the next video. Take it easy, guys. Love you all. Goodbye. <laughs>